the work that we do in the context of climate change and disaster, uh, it, it's like resilience has emerged from the effort to integrate the approaches as kind of a neutral term, with a term that uh, talks more directly without being caught up with the different labels of climate change and disaster risk, that uh, talks more directly to uh, the very root of what we were, we were trying to do with communities to reduce their level of vulnerability to either the adverse impacts of climate change or disaster. So we know that people have, uh, are affected in different ways and because they're affected in different ways, the emphasis on them making sure that they're much stronger, that they can bounce back much better if they're impacted and they can do that if they're more resilient. Uh, so resilient in the context of uh, they live healthy lifestyles, they're in homes that are constructed properly, uh, sanitation etc is, is up to par, you know, resilience in a development context. Well, I think one of the major challenges is to get people to move beyond the, the labels that they historically have represented and to focus on, in terms of the earlier question that I responded to, to focus on that endpoint. The endpoint is about build or reducing vulnerability of the communities and whatever manifestations of vulnerability there are, that if you can adequately address this, you're dealing with climate change or you're dealing with disaster risk. So one challenge uh, was getting, getting the groups to move beyond the labels that they historically have represented uh, and uh, move to a common ground. And that's not easy because of the silos that we operate within from the global level right down to the national level that's still perpetuated to this day. So the Pacific countries in particular are groundbreaking. But if they perpetuate those silos, those, in my view, become the major inhibitors to, to integration. Now, what, what are the, the opportunities for, for more meaningful integration? I think is to put uh, development more at the forefront of the discussion. People can relate easier to water tanks and improved agriculture and improved roads, etc., and overlay the issues of climate and disaster risk on this. So it's a development, it's kind of a development discussion first. Much easier to get people to rally around that kind of a discussion uh, than have them butting heads when they're talking about whether it's climate change or whether it's, it's disaster risk. That's, those are, that's, that's one set of challenges. Um, another set of challenges pertains to how donors have historically and still continue to channel resources uh, within the context of the silos that already exist and, and not uh, looking beyond that. Now there are obvious political reasons for this and we, we understand that, but hopefully at some point we get beyond this. Um, uh, le leadership at different levels, uh, at obviously at the global level, but uh, more closer to home, leaders at a national level, at a sub-national level, trying to make sure that people are of a singular mindset is certainly a challenge because we have all a different range of influences on how we think. So, 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 so it's, uh, it's, it, it is a, a challenge in and of itself. And apart from leadership, consistency. Consistency of effort. It's okay to undertake advocacy and you can get people to sign up to an outcome statement. And, but it's what they do beyond these things. The, the, the level of application that individuals who are in positions of influence can then take forward to then influence true change, unless that's happening uh, consistently, then uh, we'll continue 
for some time yet to be challenged within the silos and, and not fully, fully integrated. Yeah.